Hi, and welcome to Rave Leader Chat, number six for the Sermon on the Mount, focusing on Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 through 48. A um, couple quick things, just in just remembering the overarching context. We began Matthew sermon on the or Matthew five with the Sermon on the Mount, sort of uh, coming in our time of need, sort of uh, I'll call we'll call it discipleship beginnings, as we acknowledge our need for, uh, our, we acknowledge the reality of our spiritual bankruptcy, and we mourn for that, and we are asked to kind of come and trust God's love and care for us. And already by the end of chapter five, um, we really have sort of escalated up into. Uh, discipleship maturity. And so I uh, just want to sort of give you that calibration that it began at the very beginning with our need, and the Beatitudes then segued into the latter Beatitudes sort of toward our actions. Um, and then here, we really are called to higher standards, um, and particularly here, uh, Jesus is going to say, talk about being perfect or maybe perfectly mature. Um, this really is uh, significant Christian maturity, discipleship maturity, being made in Christ's likeness in every way, uh, which is part of the purpose of our well-rounded discipleship push. So just want you to keep that in mind as you, as you kind of think about this, and maybe that might be a blessing to your group. Um, know that I continue to pray for you and your leadership. Know that uh, you are doing a significant uh, blessing to uh, the kingdom of God and to the kingdom dwellers that are in your group. Uh, helping us continue to come back to God's Word, giving us another opportunity to study it, to write on it, and to be in this uh, unique crucible, this uh, interesting place, this small group where we can be formed more and more as disciples. So uh, just thank you for your continued ministry. Let's dive into the text, and we'll uh, kind of talk about these things. These are challenging verses for us, um, not only as we needed the uh, curtailment of anger two weeks ago, um, and we were blessed by... Uh, sort of reaffirmation of marriage and oaths last week, uh, we really need this teaching. This is a great reminder of what it means to experience Christ's love and to be able to reflect it to others. So verse 38 begins with uh, the same kind of pattern. Uh, you've heard it said, uh, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Well, that does appear in the Old Testament multiple times. Uh, one of those times is Exodus chapter 21, verse 24. Um, that sort of principle is actually called the lex talionis, and it uh, appears in lots of ancient cultures. Uh, the earliest uh, written version that we have of that is the uh, Code of Hammurabi in the 8th century BC. Um, and oftentimes we, as New Testament people, we hear that and we, we make it, it sounds very harsh. Uh, but question two in your study guide sort of dives into what is that, what was the real application, of that? what was the real blessing of that? If it was such a harsh principle, people would not have done that. And so uh, question two sort of asks us to consider what does this really say about justice? Um, and since it sort of appears in God's word, God's justice uh, or God's desire for justice. And second, uh, what does it say about um, revenge? And does it really limit or check wild revenge? We've, we've seen uh, that sort of escalate out of, out of control at times. And so there's a natural limiting factor to that. So... That's kind of the principle. You've heard it said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Notice it's not a life for a tooth or uh, a leg for an eye. Uh, it is sort of, you know, proportional justice. So Jesus says, but I tell you, um, and depend on your translation, um, your translation probably says something along the lines of, uh, do not resist the one who is evil. Well, a couple things we need to pick up here. Uh, first, uh, throughout, through verse 42, um, all of the verbs are you plural. Uh, this is a communal responsibility. It's not only an individual charge that you need to do this, but we collectively need to do this. Um, we're supposed to create an environment where living this out is not only done, but becomes increasingly encouraged. And so it's another great reminder of the blessing of small group and Christian community. Also notice as you kind of go through this uh, next several verses, there seems to be a crazy... Uh, focus on the other person, the person that's doing the in, the thing incorrect. And so um, it sort of sort of tips us off that Jesus has a heart for those people that are far off, those people that are even doing wrong. And we sort of maybe get cross with that until we realize, well, that's what he did for us too. While we were still enemies of God, he came and uh, went to the cross for us. 
So the word in, that oftentimes gets translated uh, resist is the same word that in every other place in the New Testament, and particularly in Romans uh, tw chapter 12, verse 17, uh, it's translated either get even or repay. So what Jesus is really saying here is instead of resist as in let, let, let them do whatever they want to you, um, it's don't actively try to get even, don't repay. And the way that it's in this sort of a unique past tense, um, it really sort of a literal translation could be, don't even try to get even. Don't try to get even with those that are doing evil. Now we come to another little section, depending on your translation, it might says the one who's doing evil, or it might say the evil one. Well, what is that? Or who is that? Well, I think the best is leaving it sort of open that it can be both. It can be capital T-H, the evil one, or capital T, the evil one, the devil, or, and it also includes the one presently doing that evil. So it's the individual in front of us and the other person. Don't try to repay the devil. Don't try to repay the one who's doing evil to you. Uh, don't try to repay them. And so there's this sort of principle in both of our sections today that we, uh, we sort of treat people uh, understanding that they're under the sickness of sin or they're being influenced by the devil or they're uh, not of their sort of right mind. In the same way that we, we don't hold people who are, uh, who are acting out of illness, with, we, don't, we hold them responsible. We don't uh, sort of degrade them because of their, their activities. And we don't try to get even with them when they're not acting out of their best. And that's kind of the, the underlying principle here. Now, notice as we sort of, our hackles start to come up about, wait a second, notice Jesus labels evil as evil. He's not saying it's not evil. He's not saying don't, don't think that it's not evil. He's saying don't try to get even with them. Um, and notice he's not, he's sort of offering or asking us to do a third thing. Our, our initial reaction is either to fight or flight. We either want to, you know, sort of stand up for our own things or we want to run away from this place. And Jesus really encourages a third way, a more creative mode of discipleship. And in some ways, he really encourages us to stand there with poised faith. Why poised faith? Well, poised faith really sort of understands that Jesus is ultimately the judge and that one day there will be a last judgment. And so since Jesus is the only judge and the perfect judge, and one day that all injustice will be corrected, uh, that frees us from the false assumption that we have to take matters into our own hands, that we have to administer justice, particularly individually. Um, there are times when the church, particularly in, inside the church, are called to, to discipline one another. But here, the, you're not supposed to make things right and enact judgment and justice on your own. Uh, we're usually poorly equipped to do that. We're not very good at it. Um, and so that kind of echoes that Romans 12 passage that we cited earlier. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Don't repay evil for evil. And then Jesus sort of gives us four examples, uh, four different uh, areas uh, where this third way might take place. And so first, uh, he will sort of walk through each one of them. First is the slap, uh, sort of a, an insult to our honor. And what does he call us to do? He calls us again to poised faith, to be able to stand there and offer the other cheek as well. He offers, asks us to do more creative discipleship, a nonviolent response, um, sort of hanging in there and saying, no, this is, is not right, but it's going to be not right, not because I'm ready to punch and not because I ran away, uh, but because I, I'm going to be here. Uh, and I, we'll talk about that purpose here in just a second. Second example is the, uh, the coat and the tunic. So if you're being sued for your outer coat, uh, most men in, at the particular time, or most people at the time, wore two things. You wore a long uh, tunic, sort of a really long shirt, almost like a nightgown that we would sort of say, um, and an overcoat. And the poor would sleep in that overcoat. Um, and so Jesus says, if, you, if they're going to sue you for your coat, uh, give them your tunic as well. Um, don't, don't stand there and assert your own, own values. Um, don't stand up for your own rights. In some ways, you'd say you'd, we'd rather be naked than to, than to fight this uh, illegal thing in court. And so the, the concept really is unfair litigation. And again, Jesus is sort of asking us to, to rise to a different occasion, to sort of expose uh, the bad-heartedness of the other by standing there in a, in a very different way. 
third is the extra mile. If they ask you to go one mile, go a second mile. The context is uh, sort of the Roman soldier could, by law, ask you to go one mile, but after the second mile, you couldn't be asked. And Jesus is saying, tell you what, surprise him. Blow, blow his expectation away. Uh, say, hey, can I walk a second mile? Um, it really, the category really is exploitation. And Jesus, again, drives us to a very creative discipleship response to try to first show God's love in us toward the other person, and secondly, and hopefully, a, a, another result. And then third, it's the, the offer, or so when someone asks you for something, and notice what it says, it doesn't say give them whatever they're asking for, it says give to whoever's asking, so there's some room for mitigation in what it's asked. But really the concept here, the offense here, is one of being taken advantage of. Uh, we hear that all the time. Well, I don't know that that person's really doing whatever with the funds. Um, and again, Jesus sort of calls us to it, give something, um, try to respond at least to the heart of need and or the perceived need uh, with something. So question five sort of gets to the question of what's the purpose of this creative discipleship? What's the, the end result? Well, I think there's two. And I think the order is crucially important. Uh, first and foremost, it's obedience. It's taking God's word seriously and trying to do it. Um, you're not doing it for any other purpose initially other than saying, I've experienced God's love like this in me, and God's asking me to reflect his love like this. Therefore, I'm going to reflect his love for this. Not saying it's easy, not saying it's not a challenge. Uh, this is extra miling is a real discipleship maturity issue, as we mentioned. Second, in a distant second, is that you are hoping to, to present conditions uh, that God's love might change the heart of the other. Uh, one author sort of described it as you're trying to set the stage for a moral exorcism. Uh, we've seen this in the, the civil rights movement when uh, that pure hatred of Bull Connor in the South and, and spraying children with fire hoses really broke the heart of a nation and, and allowed there to be change where change didn't seem possible. But that's the second reason. If we're doing this only for the second, we're losing sight of the one who is Lord and who calls us to do this. Uh, so the first part is really about Christian maturity and about uh, responding in a crazy, creative, uh, Jesus-love way that really surprises the other people and sort of says, we're going to stand here because we know who God is, we know that justice reigns, and we know that we don't have to be the one that meets it out. Now moving to the second section, uh, which really ties well into this. Verse 43, uh, you've heard it said, you shall love your enemy, or you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Well, that first part is uh, straight out of the scriptures. Uh, the second part, sort of not, well, not in a literal sense, but in a perceived sense. Um, there are definitely passages in the Old Testament uh, where God sort of says, you know, you go in and if they're, my, if they're enemies for me, uh, they need to be cleared out of the Holy Land. And there are some Psalms that we call the imprecatory Psalms uh, that sort of ask, that sort of call out prayerful uh, discipline and vengeance on the evildoer. Well, over time, what that sort of became in practice is, yes, I'm called to love my neighbor, and my neighbor are those people who live right next to me or who are closest to me, and I am called uh, to sort of take a, uh, a more active hatred toward the enemies of God. That was kind of the overarching thinking, and that's kind of what Jesus represented. You, you understand the principle. You're supposed to love your neighbor and hate your enemies and particularly hate God's enemies. And Jesus says, no, that's not the standard. Um, yeah, you might be able to find some places in the Old Testament where you could find a foothold there, but that's not the way of my disciples, and that's not his way either. So in verse 44, but I tell you, and he tells us to do two things, to love our neighbors and pray for those that persecute us. Um, so notice what he's, he's saying. No, instead, um, instead of you having to decide how you love people, um, I love brothers and sisters in Christ, I love my neighbor, and then I hate my enemy. He's saying, I can free you from all of that. It's supposed to be a love principle in every direction. You're, lust, you're called to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You're called to love your neighbor uh, you're called to love your brother and sister like Christ loves us. We're, we're called to love the least of these. You're called to love neighbor. It is a love ethic in every direction. And then he says, but, and pray for those that persecute you. And that really does two things. First, it's oftentimes 
the only viable way for us to love our enemy. Um, we frequently don't have the access to do that, and we pray for them, and praying for them is going to change our heart for them, and praying for them means pray, praying at its best is asking God's blessing on. And so it's going to change our heart. Now, notice um, Jesus doesn't ask us to pray for destruction of the enemy. Um, in the same way that from the cross, Jesus prayed forgiveness for those that were crucifying him. Jesus asks us to engage in that, and, and we remember that Stephen did that as well. And so it's really called to a much different way of life. And right as we're, we're reading that, going, wait a second, how, how, why would we do this? Verse 45 comes in and answers that why. Uh, so that you might be called sons and daughters of God. Now, a couple things here. First, we, we hear echoes of uh, one of the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5, verse 9, the call of the peacemakers. Blessed are those who are peacemakers, because they shall be called. And we remember the context. Jesus is speaking to disciples here, and he's saying, you already have somewhat of a relationship with me, but if you want greater intimacy with me, love your enemies. You want to dive into the advanced courses of what it means to, to be a disciple. Love your enemies, and you will be drawn closer and closer to God. Because isn't that what God did? While we were still enemies, while we were far off, while we were filled with sin, Jesus came and loved us first. God honors the hearts of those who are merciful. God honors the hearts of the peacemaker. God wants us to continue to embody this love that has changed our lives and reflect it to the world. And so then God reminds us, that's kind of what he does just in general in verse 45b, uh, through what we would call creation, what science would call the natural order. Uh, Jesus says that's how God has been showering even the non-righteous, even the evil with uh, love as well. God sends his, the rain on the just and the unjust. He's blessing the unjust, uh, oftentimes in equal measure with the just. God is showering people with goodness, even those who don't deserve it, and always those who don't deserve it. So then Jesus gives us sort of two small examples to help us understand that better. And so the first example is one of the tax collector, and we need to remember that in Jesus' context, the tax collector was a Jewish citizen who was working for the Roman government to take taxes from the, from the Jewish people, and oftentimes at an exorbitant rate. They were seen as traitors and sellouts. And Jesus says, but if tax collectors know this worldly principle to love those who love you, to love those who benefit you, that really can't be a pretty high standard then, right? Like, that, that's not that big a deal. That's what the world does. Even tax collectors know you love those who love you and you're mean to those who aren't nice to you. And then the second example is one of simple greeting. So it's interesting. It takes it from this really high level of going, wait a second, we're not tax collectors, right? To the simplicity, and this is oftentimes what's true of discipleship, very everyday ways that our discipleship can show a greeting. And you know this is true. We greet people that we like differently than people that we don't like or we don't know. And Jesus is saying, so even in the simple greeting, you can extend this and notice what now, notice what the pagans do. Notice what non-believers do. Um, Gentiles greet people who like them and don't greet people that don't. So can that really be a, a great mark of what it means to be a brother and sister in Christ if we only greet those that are brothers and sisters in Christ? No, he says, go, you got to go do a higher level. That can't be the standard. Um, you, we're, you're called to something greater than that. God's love is greater than that. And then he gets to that last passage, which sort of reminds us as we sort of did the introduction. Um, your translation probably says something like, be perfect uh, as your heavenly father is perfect. Now, the word perfect there is teleos, which means sort of to complete, to perfect, to, to live to the full, uh, to be mature. And really, I think that's probably the best translation. I think a better translation of, of verse 48 is, uh, therefore, you must be perfectly mature as your father is perfectly mature. You must continue to grow in faith to that point where you can do this the same way that your father's already done it. And uh, question eight sort of talks about the, the challenge of these examples and what's surprising. Question 10 sort of prods us to say, not only how did, Jesus, how did God the father do this, how does Jesus do this as well? How does he embody uh, this principle? How does he display this Christian maturity 
uh, mature, perfect maturity in faith. And so these are great passages for us. This is a great reminder uh, of the road of discipleship we're on, that we start at the beginning uh, with coming in our need, but God is filling us with his love, God is transforming us with his love, and God is calling us to reflect that love in greater and greater places. Where does this tie into our discipleship uh, six marks right now? Uh, I think this is a great place to continue to think about uh, those last two. How do we go out and bless others with Christian service? And how do we go out and bless others with good words and good works that they might see uh, the truth that we have? Oftentimes when we do either one of those, we might uh, receive scorn and, uh, and challenge, and our temptation would be to, to sort of become combative or to become dismissive and leave, and yet we're called to be a lasting witness, loving them as Christ loved us. So once again, thanks so much for your continued ministry. Thank you for letting uh, God's word flow through you and your group to be written on their hearts. Uh, may we continue to live more fully into this. Take care and God bless.